Hello again, and a warm welcome to Bridging Minds. I'm Kamal, and you've joined us for part three, hour three, of a conversation with Dr. John Andrew Morrow and myself on his research and work concerning the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christian communities of his age. These are communities in Greater Arabia, Syria, Egypt, and elsewhere in the Middle East. And these were covenants, treaties of protection and mutual benefit. And he has detailed his research into these as well as other priceless manuscripts, including lost works of hadith, tafsir, uh, all kinds of lost literature in Andalusia, his work in Andalus in Spain, and also a lot of his reflections on his life his conversion to Islam and some of the traumas and difficulties he went through as a young teenager coming into Islam and much much more so thank you for joining and if you like what you see in here please give the like button a little tickle subscribe if you haven't already and by all means please share this with your friends thank you We've already addressed the issue of textual transmission, and uh, you know, if I start looking at you know, these long, you know, long lists of references, it might get boring and so on. Um, I mean, you asked how, uh, you know, why do some of them differ from what's mentioned in canonical hadith literature? Okay, well, that's a very good question. Um, just speaking in general terms, let's see. We can take uh, the covenant of Najran, for example. All right. Now, it exists in different versions in our sources. There's a very short, like, bulletproof, bu you know, like, uh, bullet uh, version, bullet point version. Now, there's another one that's, like, medium, and there's one that's longer. And do these... Are these different accounts of the same document, or do they date from different periods? Uh, were there several treaties of Najran, or was there just one? And, you know, the people who were transmitting it were just focusing on the main points, or some were, a lot, you know, were, were more uh, comprehensive about it. So these are debates that we have among scholars, but it is uh, attested to in uh, a vast number of Muslim and non-Muslim books, the Treaty of Najran. I mean, one would be hard-pressed to argue that uh, it's inauthentic. Um, now, so there are all these versions of the Treaty of Najran, the Covenant of Najran, uh, transmitted um, through Muslim sources. This document also has been transmitted through Christian sources. Um, the difference is that they're actually manuscripts, and the manuscripts have survived. Uh, and they've been transmitted from generation to generation to generation and so on. They're found in many parts of the world. We find these manuscripts in uh, the archives of libraries, we find them in the UK, in France, uh, you know, I'm sure Germany, uh, um, of course, uh, yeah, all, all over, many, many different libraries. They're also found in monasteries, monasteries uh, in Greece, um, also in, um, of course, uh, in Egypt, uh, in, uh, in Palestine, and uh, all the way to Armenia, some of them are found in Iran, and so um, widely distributed, widely distributed these documents. Now, if we compare them, the Christian versions, and again, this is problematic to, to, to refer to them as like Christian transmissions, because if you read the documents, they were written down by chief judges, of you know the Ottomans or the previous dynasties and so on. So they're written down by Muslims. Okay. 
Uh, they're authenticated by Muslims. We have their names, we have their stamps, we have their seals. Um, and who were they producing? I mean, who was behind the production of these documents? It was the caliph or the sultan himself. So it was part and parcel of uh, Ottoman domestic and foreign policy to disseminate these covenants. You see, one has to have an understanding of how, like, the Ottomans structured their society. Uh, it was known as, um, well, uh, the millet system, or Ahl al Milla, or uh, the, the empire was divided into, like, uh, I guess, uh, semi autonomous uh, religious communities, right? And so the Christians governed themselves according to their laws, and they had the right to tax, and they had their own courts and everything. Um, so that, that that was the system. So these were these these were uh, documents, uh, imperial documents, uh, produced uh, by the empire itself and given to uh, churches, monasteries, uh, cathedrals, uh, patriarchates, and everything. Uh, now, I kind of liken them to like a business license. You come into the business, it's right on the wall there. But they would display them in the entrance of uh, their monasteries. So any traveler or anything would come there. Basically saying these people are under the protection of the empire of the sultan himself, who is following the tradition established by the prophet. So to say that these are Christian documents and there's no such thing as a Christian hadith, this is not correct. They've just been preserved in uh, their archives. But these documents are also preserved in Muslim archives as well. Um, they're found in uh, the, 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 in the archives uh, in Turkey, uh, in Topkapi. I mean, there was a book... Uh, there was, uh, you know, one of the scribes of uh, of the Ottomans, uh, Feridun Bey, he compiled uh, a work called uh, Manshua as Salatin, or basically the Encyclopedia of the Sultans. And it starts with uh, several letters, you know, these letters of the Prophet that are so famous and circulate on the internet, and there's pictures of them. So it includes some of those letters. Uh, and it includes the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the monks of Mount Sinai, the Ashtiname or the Ahad and Nabi. There, okay, written by you know a Muslim scribe and so on. And then after that, it has uh, copies of all the uh, the treaties that uh, the Ottomans concluded with other Christian communities. I mean, they made treaties with the French. They made treaties with, and again, they're all me. They all mirror, and they're all all they they're all modeled on the covenant of the Prophet. Okay, so, but anyhow, to to, to get back to the covenant of Najran, if we compare uh, these longer versions to the Muslim versions, they're basically the same. All of the major points are identical. Yes, in those so-called, you know, Christian versions, which are really Islamic versions, um, you know, the actual manuscript. So we're comparing what's related in Muslim books to actual physical manuscripts. All of the main points are the same. Uh, they might be longer. It might be more elaborate. And so what do we make of this? All right. So... Um, one could contend that the versions in Muslim sources are authentic to the letter, they didn't suppress or edit or cut anything, and that these versions that, you know, have survived in monasteries and archives around the world, the longer versions, well, they, they, they were expanded upon. This is very, very problematic. That argument is incredibly weak. The Sultan, I mean, they had access to the Islamic sources. They had those versions. And if some scribe, Muslim or Christian, started changing things and, and, and you know, expanding upon it and giving them rights that yeah, they would have had their heads cut off. I, I don't believe they could have pulled it off. No way. No way. Uh, no. So I don't buy it that uh, these were expanded upon. I think it's the other way around. I think the versions that survived in Muslim sources have been edited, 
that maybe they were censored, they were shortened. Um, maybe as a pro, uh, as part of the the process of oral transmission. Now, if there was a written document issued by the prophet that was quite lengthy, and you read it or you heard it declared, how much of it would you actually retain? Well, the odds are you'd retain the main points, and that's what we find in in, in the uh, books of Hadith and Tarikh and so on. Basically, the main points that are found there. So, um, enough then with uh, you know uh, that the uh, covenant uh, of Najran. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Uh, you asked about the Treaty of Makna. Yes, and its documentary transmission for the uninformed listeners. What are some of the documentary differences between Muslim sources and the Cairo Geniza copy? And I was want to understand the differing opinions on this matter. Is the Treaty of Makna an authentic treaty with the Christ with the children of Israel? And are there others that you have found in the literature? If it is not authentic, does it reflect a more authentic earlier core? Okay, this is interesting. This is a fantastic question. So let me see here. So basically, we have uh, a version, okay, of the Treaty of Makna. Now, again, so, I mean, it's attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so, presumably, the companions thought it was authentic. Uh, and we know that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali all protected the early religious communities. Clearly, they were following a precedent. Um this document is found in Waqadi, so 822 CE, Ibn Sa'd, 845, Ibn Zanjaway, Baladuri, Ibn Hiban, Ibn Asakir, uh, Al Fariqi, and that's uh, the 12th century, the Libri Splendorum. Now we're into a Latin work, okay? So again, we're seeing it in Muslim sources, we're also seeing it in non Muslim sources, Abu Al Fidda. 13th, 14th century, George al Masin Ibn al-Amid, 13th century, Maris, Christian source, Bar Hebraeus, Christian source, 13th century, uh, Ibn Kathir, Amros, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Qayyim uh, addressed it. He thought it was fake. Everyone else thought it was authentic. Feridun Bey, that scribe of the Ottomans, died in 1583. Uh, Ahmed bin Joseph, 1599. Uh, this is a non-Muslim. And then there's like Orientalists and scholars and travelers and so on, uh, you know, from the 18th century, 19th century and so on. And I go up to all the way to contemporary scholars. So anyhow, this is basically the genealogy of this document for the version found in uh, Islamic sources, which basically reads, I'm going to read it because it's really short, uh, to the sons of Hanina. Again, we don't know how to read it. Some people read it Hanina, Janba, Habiba, whatever. Who are the Jews of Makna and the people of Makna near Ayla. Your request has reached me when you return to your village. With the arrival of this letter, your security is ensured, and you are granted Allah's protection and that of his messenger. Allah's messenger forgives you the wickedness you have done and for all of the sins you have committed. Therefore, you're granted Allah's protection and that of his messenger. No one will do you injustice or harm, for it is the messenger of Allah himself who gives you protection from what he himself will not do to you. Your arms belong to the messenger of Allah, as well as all the slaves that are with you. Uh, and the rings, apart from what the messenger of Allah or the envoys of the messenger of Allah will allow you to keep. And from on your, onward, you will owe a quarter of your date harvest and a quarter of your fishing yield and a quarter of your yarn uh, spun by your women, except for these, you will be free of any levy or uh, whatever tax. Uh, if you if you will listen and obey the Messenger of Allah, will respect the honorable among you and forgive the sinners among you. And for the information of the believers and the Muslims, anyone coming to the people of Makna uh, who is concerned uh, with their well-being will benefit, and anyone who intends doing them harm will suffer. There will be no chief over you other than one of you or one of the messenger of Allah's people. Well, the translator here, Moshe Khil, translated it as people, but it says Ahl al-Bayt Rasulullah. So you will have no leader over you except one of your own or the family of the, pro uh, of, uh, the messenger of Allah. So this is the version that we have in Islamic sources. 
Many Muslim scholars consider it to be authentic. There might be a few who dispute it because they think, aha, this smells of Shiism here. And was this written at a later uh, period in order maybe to appeal to, uh, I don't know, to Shia sentiments? Who knows? But th that's our version, okay? And so basically, what does it say? You know, you're safe, okay? Right? You, 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 and of course, that's what, you know, you would send armies or you would send messengers and you would say, listen, you know, are you willing to, to join our confederacy? You know, our people, uh, these are, do you have any terms? Uh, you know, do you agree to pay tributes? We will protect you. You will have freedom of religion. Anyone who tries to harm you, haha, they're going to have to deal with us. Okay. And you know what? You can pick your ruler, of course, a vassal state or whatever. You're subservient to us. You're going to be ruled by one of your people, uh, or uh, I will send you a member of my family or whatever, or, you know, a member of my community. Okay, so, um, yeah, what's the problem here? There's no problem here. I mean, who would object to that based on reading the, the, the Quran? Um, you know, who would object to that? And now if you look at the version in the Cairo Geniza, which is basically, you know, a graveyard of manuscripts from the Jewish community, um, it's based, I'm not going to read it, it's a little bit longer. Um, well, I mean, I can touch upon maybe some points. Maybe do I have a shorter version here where I highlight things? I'm going to look in another book I have if I have just a little summary of it. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, yeah, okay. Page 85 here. We'll just do a little summary of it, maybe. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just go through it and look at some of the points. Um, it explains how this, uh, first of all, there, there's like a preamble or an introduction or a preface or whatever you want to call it. It just explains the history of this treaty and when it was granted. Okay. So it starts with historical context. Okay. That's interesting. And, and you could see why someone would drop that in later narrations. It explains the context when it was given and so on. Um, then it starts in the name of Allah, the most compassionate to the most merciful. It's a letter from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah to Hanina, and so on. Um, you know, he recognizes that they've submitted to his rule. Yours is the safeguard of Allah and his messenger with regard to your person's belief, property, and so on. And again, this is the same thing we find in all the different treaties that the Prophet made with people. Um, yeah, you shall not have the annoyance of land tax, nor shall a forelock of yours be cut. Okay, we're dealing with Jewish people here. So we will not touch a hair on your head. You've submitted to us, okay? Um, no army shall tread on your soil. We're not going to occupy you. If anyone attacks you, we're going to fight them. If you ask for assistance, we're going to give it to you. Uh, no one is going to rule over you except one of your own um, or, or someone from uh, the house of the prophets. Um if any of you, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So if any of you follow uh, the religion of the Messenger of Allah, um, you will receive a fourth of uh, of the khums and so on and things like that. Um, yeah, it's the duty of uh, the Messenger of Allah and the Muslims to fulfill this letter. Whoever whoever reads it, alters it or changes it is going to be cursed by God. And this we find in many covenants of the Prophet, right? That uh, whoever harms, you know, a, a, a dhimmi or ahl al dhimma, I will testify against him on the Day of Judgment. Ahmed al Wakil wrote a, a very long, a, a very interesting and detailed study on that hadith and all of its. Uh, so it, that, tra that tradition is found in, in many covenants of the Prophet. Uh, and then this one, it has witnesses. It was. Uh, uh, the witnesses were uh, uh, Amar ibn Yasser, uh, Salman al-Farisi, and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. So, for some critics, 
that might be suspicious, right? They might say, wait a second here, these are the, the, mo the, the favorite companions of the Shia, okay? Uh, you know, and notice that in the version in like Islamic sources, there are no witnesses. Um, so, but then again, any decent, you know, prophet loving, God loving Sunni Muslim loves these companions of the prophet just as much as the Shia do. I mean, what do Sunni have against uh, Abu Dhar or Salman al-Farisi or Amar ibn Yasser? I mean, these are, they're famous people and they were prominent companions. So why would you have some like obscure companion? you know, witness a document. Um, these were close companions. That makes sense. It looks like in the Muslim version, maybe they dropped these names because maybe they were being associated with Shiism or anyhow. But if, if we look at both of these documents, well, it's the contention of Ahmed al-Wakil that the original is the one, in, as far as I recall, in, in the Cairo Geniza, and that the, the version that has survived in Islamic sources uh, has been, you know, uh, has been censored to a certain degree due to political motivations, all right? Maybe it was done by the Abbasids or something. They felt that, hold on a second, you're giving way too many rights to these people. And that's the, another argument made with the covenants with the Christians, that, wow, these are a lot of rights to give people. So maybe we should, you know, uh, yeah, we should trim these down a little bit. So it's possible that it was just too much. So again, but, you know, the gist of it, the core of it, the essence of it, you know, what's the problem? What's the difference? The basic principles, the right to life, freedom of religion, right? Um, you know, issues of taxation. Um, so there you go. Um, okay. You know, it, it dawned on me, it crossed my mind, the point that you made in reading it, you know, it's it, it's interesting that there is a embedded curse on those who would diminish these rights, and I it's there's something dangerous and tragic that strikes me if you had Muslim editors, you know, going through the text and thinking, okay, uh, this is too many, you know, we'll, we'll just get rid of this, we'll get rid of this, like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly could not have intended this, so this. That is such a from a you know spiritual perspective. You know, someone's a materialist, or they you know, or they're just looking at it historically. It's like, you know, ethically that's wrong, but so what? But for someone who, if someone actually believes in this whole Islam business, um, that would strike me as an incredibly tragically self-destructive thing to do. That would thereafter also poison the literature itself. Um, putting oneself in the position of judging, you know, well, the messenger probably didn't mean this. These people have too many rights. Well, you know, we'll just strike this from the record. So that's an interjection. I'm sorry. It's uh, Well, yes, yes. And they would argue that times have changed. The situation has changed. Um in that area, the Muslims were the majority. These people were the minority. The situation has changed now. We're a tiny minority ruling over a Christian ma majority. And that was the fact for centuries. The elite consisted of like Arab Muslims, many, you know, of these conquerors and so on, or the descendants of the, those so-called con conquerors, so-called, because that's that's been disproven. There is no evidence of a violent conquest of that region. Basically, maybe armies came and they said, do you submit? And they said, well, after all this war between the Persians and the Byzantines, we've had enough, you know? <laughs> Basically, they opened the doors and said, okay, where's this covenant? Where's this treaty? So it, anyhow, there's no evidence archaeologically of like, you know, huge battles and devastation and destruction of cities. It's simply not true. They surrendered to, 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 to these people. But anyhow... Um, so maybe these leaders, they felt threatened, okay? So, you know, we Muslims are a minority, you are a majority, okay? So maybe we should clip your wings a little bit. We're not going to cull you. We're not going to turn you into fried chicken or anything. But we need to kind of, you know, clip your wings a bit uh, for our own safety. Uh, this is a possibility. The other possibility is that 
They were threatened by outside forces. Okay, they were attacked by the Mongols. There were the Crusades and so on, incursions. Now, again, the relationship between the Christians of the Middle East with Muslims is very different than the Christians of Europe. Okay, this is very clear. Uh, the 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 many the, the Christians in the Muslim world uh, they fought alongside the Muslims against the Crusaders and so on. Uh, they viewed these the, themselves as brothers and brethren and so on. Th there was a period of coexistence there for a long time. So I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Uh, or, or I don't like to use that term. I'm just trying to give you know, and and it's terrible for me. I'm always on the other side saying yes, protect these people, and I'm criticizing the people who introduce these restrictions, but. Perhaps that is how they reasoned, um, that they had to curtail some rights or new situations had arisen and they didn't have um, they didn't have rules in place to deal with it. Now Imam Shafi'i, uh, he actually prepared a template for a covenant of protection. okay? And I wrote an article about it. It's a chapter in one of my forthcoming books on Muhammad and the Christians. And I know Ahmed al-Wakil and Ibrahim Zayn, uh, you know, on their own side, have been, uh, have been doing some work on that document as well. It seems to have been inspired on, uh, on the covenant of the Prophet. Or at the very least, uh, the, the, the treaties of the early Muslim conquerors, which in turn had been inspired on the covenant of the Prophet. So did he have direct knowledge or indirect knowledge? Anyhow, it's not an issue. But it follows the structure of the covenant of the prophet. And I compare and contrast them. I give the covenant of the prophet and I give his version of a template that he prepared for the caliphs. And he says, this is what you use when you conquer a Christian community. These are the terms. Some of the terms are identical to those found in the covenants of the prophet. Many of the rights and the protections are not there. And I would say at least half of it are actually um, clauses that curtail rights. So rights that pre previously existed are being removed. Now, I, I, I yeah, again, some people would take great offense uh, at that, but again, don't shoot the messenger. I didn't write that template uh, 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 <laughs> uh, of protection, the covenant of Dhimma, as he calls it. Imam al Shafi would need to explain why he did that, and he will answer for that. I know Ahmed al Wakil and Ibrahim Zain, they, you know, they're indulgent and they think that, again, uh, he had the best of intentions. One could argue that this was the first step towards what's known as the covenant, the Treaty of Umar. So this is interesting. There are two covenants of Omar. There is one that is vicious in terms of repressing the rights of Christians. And there's another one that's almost identical in terms of to the covenants of the prophet and the treaty of Najran, and in which it gives them freedom of life, freedom of religion, uh, no forced conversions, none of that stuff. They can't be oppressed. All the you know their churches can't be destroyed. Uh, their daughters can't be married by force. All of these things. So again, I mean, it, clearly that that pact of Omar, the bad one, the negative one, the pseudo pact of Omar, is a forgery, and we know that's a fact because it exists in in, in, in different versions. And the the more recent they get, the more repressive they get. Okay, so they were, you know, they had removed protections, and now they were adding all kinds of limitations and restrictions. It was getting it. so. If you study the evolution of that document, it's clear that it's it's a forgery. And so, um, you know, one could contend that you know that was one of the first steps towards a greater repression towards uh, Christians living uh, under Muslim rule. But, of course, Allahu Alam, uh, people can read the document, they can read my study, and if uh, Ahmed al-Wakil and Ibrahim Zain published their study, they can, they can examine that. Um, yes, cause for consternation, for sure. Yes. Um, 
are a cause for uh, perhaps a moment of uh, a reflection. Yes, a moment of reflection. You know, it's uh, it's it's interesting how sometimes we Muslims have tended to this talk for I won't say deify. That's not fair. But effectively speaking, actually, you know, basically deifying humans. And they say, no, we're not. And it's the people who often, I think, who scream shirk most who actually do this. Um, and I, I think the, the work that you're describing um, definitely opens up a space for reflection. And I wonder if, if, in, our, and if, if in our present era, the so wrought with misunderstanding between the faith communities of the world. And we Muslims, we have our narratives. Other communities have theirs. But I think that reflecting on the different versions of these covenants and how they've come to us, not only open up an like, exploration of a lot of history, yes. but also, you know, maybe heal some or try to work towards healing certain wounds. Um, yeah, and so I, I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and one of the interesting things is that um, irrespective of whether Muslims followed these covenants or violated these covenants, the Greek Orthodox Church has always stood firmly uh, in their defense of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, this is their opportunity to say, well, he was a face, fake prophet. Here's the proof. Look at what these people are doing. He's an oppressor, right? I mean, they, they could have took that whole Islamophobic, you know, Protestant slant or so on. No. In good times and in bad, they always insisted that the Prophet Muhammad gave us these protections. They didn't have to do that. They've stood their ground for 1,400 years. And so I understand that. Okay. And people need to remember that we're talking about human beings, okay? I mean, it's like, does Biden reflect America or Christianity or Trump or George Washington or whatever, or, you know, uh, again, I mean, we're dealing with human beings, right? And so there are good leaders and there are bad leaders. There are good dynasties. There are bad dynasties. People do good. They do bad. They have different policies, right? So, um, you know, this is important to remember. And so if we look back and we study the history, absolutely, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali respected these treaties and covenants. And this is confirmed in the literature of the Christians of that time, okay? Um, so we can confirm that they did respect the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad. No doubt about it. Now, the Umayyads were on good terms. Actually, well, I mean, Uthman was married to a Christian woman. Uh, Muawiyah was married to a Christian woman. Uh, Yazid was the son of a Christian woman. And by the way, you know, the Ottoman sultans, virtually all of them were the sons of Christian women. Okay, so we need to look at that as well. But we know that uh, the rightly guided caliphs respected these, these documents. Uh, the Umayyads were on good terms with the, Christ, with the Christians. And ah Ahmed al-Jalad has an article about that, about an inscription of a Christian soldier in the army of Yazid as well, who speaks very favorably of him. So Yazid, as demonized as he's been for the events of Karbala and so on, and all of that is even disputed, but nevertheless, um, he was on good terms with Christians. And in the Christian literature, he is spoken about, Muawiyah and Yazid are spoken favorably uh, in Christian literature from that period, okay? So the Umayyads were evil and wicked and so on, maybe against their political opponents among, among the Muslims. Yeah, sure. But... Uh, did they persecute and oppress the religious, you know, these uh, different religious uh, denominations and so on? No, on the contrary, they didn't. Now, then we get into um, maybe that there were more restrictions towards the end of the Umayyad period. 
where the community of believers that you know consisted of of uh, uh, you know the the Menin, the Muslims, the followers of Muhammad, the Jews, the Christians, they you know they had coalesced. Maybe it starts to disintegrate. Maybe according to Fred Donner, uh, Islam e emerges as a distinct religion and identity. and people start being othered. Perhaps at that time, the covenants of the prophet were acknowledged and were by and large respected, but some barriers were put in place. People are starting to erect boundaries and walls between communities, right? That this is, you know, hmm. um, so the um, Abbasids, um, by and large, they respected the covenants of the prophet, They didn't promote them very much, uh, but there are references to them and so on. Um, you know, the Mamluks, we have documents tracing back to their time. Um, uh, and then, yeah, and all the way the Ottomans, all the way up to the 20th century. Now, they, like I said, um, they, they were inspired by the constitution of Medina, And the Ashtiname, or the covenant of the prophet with the monks from Mount, Mount Sinai. And they really emphasize that in, in all of their doings. Uh, then if we look on the Persian side, uh, we, we find that the Safavids as well were respecting the covenants of the prophet. And we have copies of these manuscripts from, from New Zulfa uh, in Persia and, and, and so on. So they were very, very... Uh, They were widespread, yeah. So anyhow, well, I uh, respectful of your time. I think we've gone on almost two hours. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. It's fascinating, um, and a lot of what you're saying resonates very deeply with me. Um, oh, but the, yeah, go, uh, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, I'm excited. I mean, these questions I am too. are good, and I want to touch upon them. You know, many mm -hmm. listeners have not heard, have not even heard, or been taught about the covenants made between the Prophet Muhammad and the Christians and the Jews. It's a surprising matter. What accounts for the lack of discussion of the matter in contemporary Muslim discourse? Uh, was there more awareness of the matter in earlier times, like the Ottoman and Abbasid times? Uh, yes, I think the covenants of the Prophet were part of collective consciousness from early Islam, until basically the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So until the very end, the Sultan was saying protect, protect the Christians, he, he was uh, issuing these decrees and so on. It's actually only when they became secular, it was the young Turks and so on, uh, who went around destroying covenants of the prophet and destroying you know, churches and slaughtering Christians and so on. But anyhow, um, so yes, um, uh, in the past, based on the literature, And, and if you look in, you know, the provenance of the, the covenants of the prophet and all of these references to these documents, um, they were very, very well known uh, among Muslims, definitely among scholars, absolutely among the political leaders. And I'm, I'm sure that trickled down to the common population. Um, and memory of these documents has never faded. Among the, you know, if you, if you look at the monks from Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery, those of Mount Athos and Simonopetra and so on in Greece, um, they still remember these documents. They preserve them. They have them on display in their monasteries. So, yeah, uh, again, what happened? It was the, the, the collapse of, uh, actually, you know, it, 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 it's really... The persecution and oppression of religious minorities and Jews and Christians and so on is not um, a product of Islam. If you look at the Muslim world, it's a product of the collapse of Islam, the collapse of, uh, uh, of Islamic power. That is when all of these horrors and atrocities take place. The Assyrian uh, uh, genocide in uh, Mesopotamia, or what's now Iraq, the Armenian genocide, and then this leg, all these persecution, all you know, from uh, from from you know, from 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 Boko Haram to the the armed Islamic group to to to, to Daesh and ISIS and all all, all of this. So. Uh, uh, That is not something that would have been tolerated under the policies of the of previous Muslim empires. 
uh, they were intent on keeping the peace and protecting uh, these uh, communities uh, for the sake of uh, political um, political stability and the integrity of the empire. They didn't want these Christians to break off and create another nation. They wanted to keep them pleased and contented and so on. Um, you know, I deal with other people. I have this one guy who's telling me, oh, you know, the Ottomans and everything. And why would they let like Shia immigrate from, you know, uh, from uh, the Ottoman Empire to America when they were Kufar and everything? They don't understand the thing. Uh, all of the Shia shrines uh, in, in the Ottoman world were patronized and funded and built uh, by the Ottomans. Uh, they put all of the Shia ulama on salaries, okay? So they didn't treat them like heretics and apostates and devi deviants or anything. They wanted to appease them. They wanted to please them. You put them on the government payroll, okay? May, and, to, you know, you, you cover their shrines in gold and you build, uh, you know. Of course, that's politics. They were very tolerant. They were very tolerant. Muslims became incre increasingly intolerant after the collapse of Islamic power in the world and the creation of these secular nation states. And we find, we find, um, when the Ottoman Empire was starting to move, right, uh, as a result of all the pressure they were receiving from the Europeans, they wanted to change their laws and, you know, follow the European model. Who was kicking and screaming? Who was making an uproar? The Christians. We do not want to be citizens, okay? We're not interested in your human rights. We want to be the meat. And, and it didn't have a, a negative connotation uh, among those people. We want our protection, all right? And they understood that they needed to be protected by the government, um, you know, as religious minorities and so on. And it's, it's when that millet system collapsed that there were all these massacres. The Kurds were slaughtering the Assyrians and the, the Turks were slaughtering the Armenians and so on. That didn't happen uh, under uh, when uh, the empire was uh, healthy. Um, so, yes, um, good question. Uh, good question and um, an important answer for people to know. Uh, now, we have... I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I was just thinking, like that could be unpacked. Also, maybe at a later date. Yeah. So much like I've read so. And one of my one of my dear friends, his brother Yusuf, uh, he was a his he was a uh, historian, historian of history at the University of Cincinnati. He studied under Dr. Frierson. But uh, Yusuf, um, and a couple of you know our mutual friends, we would just sit around for hours talking about late Ottoman history and the history of the Balkans and. Um, you know, it's that that's something over the last twenty years I've done a lot of reading on and conversation with with um you know students, PhD students and and professors and just you know, I don't read unfortunately I can't read Greek and I cannot read Ottoman uh Turkey. But um just the sources in English, um that that's academic and otherwise what you're saying about the collapse of Islamic authority, of Islamic rule, the sort of Pax Islamica, and the collapse of the Ottoman authority, and the ascendancy of a lot of these, you know, the era of secular nationalism, you know, from the young Turks, before them, the young Ottomans, a lot of these movements inspired by Mazzini, you know, with Mazzini's Young Europe, um, and, you know, yeah, these intellectual circles in Cairo and Egypt and elsewhere, like, it befuddles me so much of this history. It's documented in Arabic sources, in English, in French. This isn't, this shouldn't be obscure stuff. But the, the like, I remember personally, you know, I, I'm much younger than you are, but I remember when, like, just on a level of public opinion, like, no, Sunnis didn't really care that much about Shia. Nobody really made a big deal out of them you know and, and other than like the ultra salafi types um, even then like as long as saudi arabia had good relationships with iran it was really like after 86 87 and then by like 89 90 91 that's when everyone starts just screaming they're my juicy i'm like no they're not right yes they're not zoroastrians dude 
like in my own lifetime, much less than the historical bit, but not to interject, I'm sorry. Um, but my own reading about the Ottoman past, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that the Muslim uh, Khulafa treated the Shia as uh, Kufar is absolutely risible. No, they didn't. I mean, what? they let them go in Hajj, right? Like, you know, you had, you know, Gulats, you know, these extremist sects like Ismailis, you know, the Karmatia, you know, they kidnapped the stone of the Kaaba and took it to the Nej, and brought it back broken. But like, there was an awareness that, that that's not all the Shia. But so, yeah. I just, sorry to interject. Yes, no, it's true. Now, uh, another thing I wanted to touch upon uh, to answer better your question is, you know, why haven't Muslims heard about these documents, these letters and, and treaties uh, of, of the Prophet? Well, part of the problem is that they were uh, scattered in Islamic sources. So you might find some of them in books of Hadith, and then uh, some in the Sira or Marazi literature and so on. Others you would find in, in books of Fiqh uh, or jurisprudence. They were just scattered all over the place. It wasn't until um, you know the 20th century when uh, Muhammad Hamidullah, um, you know, the famous Indian scholar, uh, he actually he, he compiled them all together. He went through all of these sources and he prepared a huge big volume called Al Wathaiq. All right. Um, now, it's in Arabic, of course, and he did his best to gather all of these letters and treaties and covenants of the Prophet. So that made it a lot easier. Uh, for, and also, he was the, the, the scholar who was the, uh, probably the first or one of the first to popularize the Constitution of Medina. And uh, a document that, was, that has been ignored and, and had been long forgotten by most Muslims. And I mean, what do you mean we have a constitution? Yeah, and it will shock you. Uh, it, it, you know, if you read it and you see what it says, those Jews you hate so much, huh? those Yehud and those Zionists and everything. Well, hold on a second. It says that they're believers and they're at one with you. Um, yeah. So I'm not talking about the, the Zionists now and everything. I'm just saying that, you know, there's no basis for like anti-Semitism and so on in, in Islam. And uh, there was a time when when Muslims and Jews coexisted as uh, f as as you know, if not co-religionists, but at least as uh, uh, as as you know, a brethren of believers. So anyhow, um, Muhammad Hamidullah al Wathaiq, definitely anyone who can read Arabic, get a copy of it, a hard copy, borrow it from a library, get a PDF copy. There you have it, the letters and treaties, and I mean it's huge. It's like a thousand pages. It's a mother of a book. Um, so these were not peripheral matters uh, to the prophet. prophet. Um, all of these treaties and covenants and so on that he made, you know, all these alliances, uh, all this alliance building. Then there was a scholar uh, from Iran, Ahmadi Mianji, who basically gathered all of these letters as well, included more, and provided his commentary on them. Okay, so that's Makatib uh, uh, al-Rasul, or the writings of the messenger. So three volumes, I believe. Again, um, who reads these things? I do. Uh, others should. <laughs> and there's another scholar, Hassan Shirazi, um, who compiled, uh, you know, a big volume of letters from the Prophet and so on and Ali and everything. So all of that was available to scholars in Arabic. Basically, no one did anything with it. Um, so again, I published this book on, on, on the covenants. I make them available uh, in English and in many, many other languages. Many other scholars have followed suit. Um, you know, that first decade, you know, 2013, starting in 2013, there was a lot of interest in the covenants of the prophet. There were many initiatives that were inspired by um, those documents. Um, now, all of this, oh, let me see. Let me see to just give you a summary here. Well, 
Okay, here are some efforts that were inspired by the covenants of the Prophet, uh, the Amman message from 2004, the Islamic Society of North America's Muslim Code of Honor from 2007, in which there's no more of this Kafir calling allowed, right? This is important. Uh, the Isna, their, their Fiqh Council, issued a fatwa in 2007. I mean, these are people all putting principles into practice, the principles found in the Constitution of Medina and the Covenants of the Prophet. Uh, the Council on Care issued a statement in 2009. There was the Shoulder-to-Shoulder -shoulder campaign in 2010. Uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Tahir al-Qadri in 2010. There was the Covenants Initiative that Charles Upton conceived of, and hundreds of uh, Muslim scholars uh, signed it. Uh, basically saying that we stand behind the principles found in these documents. This is how we will treat each other and uh, treat uh, uh, Christians. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, he published, uh, This is not the path to paradise, a, re a response to ISIS. There was the letter to Baghdadi, uh, fatwas from, uh, you know, Ahmed al-Tayyib from al-Azhar, uh, and so on and so on and so on. There's dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of efforts on the part, declarations on the part of Muslims, fatawa, all re, uh, reasserting uh, the principles found in those documents. So, alhamdulillah, I mean, you know, why do, uh, you know, why do, you know, why is it that so few Muslims are familiar with it? Well, you know, far more Muslims are familiar with these documents now than they were b before 2013. Um an enormous amount of work has yet to be done. Uh, these documents should be studied in Islamic seminaries uh, and universities. They should be taught in madrasa. They should become part of the curriculum, part of the educational system. And there are efforts in that regard. And some countries have reached out to me how they can integrate this into the curriculum and teach this to children from an early age. I want to 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 um, circle back a little bit about the importance of uh, of education and children and what you cheat what you teach children. So again, you know, I read the Quran and so on, and one of the first documents that I read, believe it or not, was the Ashtiname, the Covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world. Okay, so Quran, and then I came across a copy uh, of that, uh, and it amazed me, it blew it away, it confirmed everything that was in the Quran, and I said, what a magnificent human being, a light that dispels darkness, makarim al uh, you know, uh, yes, what noble virtues this man Muhammad had. Uh, you know, to me, it was the Quran put into practice. So that colored my understanding of Islam. The Quran and the Ashtiname, and then I'm surrounded by Osama bin Laden and Abu Bakr Baghdadi and all of these people. You can understand that I was, hello, what is going on here? Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, do you think there is an agenda to suppress the covenants and why? Well... That's a loaded question, <laughs> but an important one indeed. Um, after the Covenants of the Prophet with the Christians of the World was published in 2013, I was, uh, well, you know, I used to speak almost every weekend. The demand was so great. Almost every weekend I was traveling mosque to mosque, university, everything all over the world, sometimes weeks at a time, months at a time. I was lecturing uh, everywhere, worldwide. It got to a point where it was exhausting. It could have been a full-time job. Um, and I had to take things, uh, I had to step things back a bit for health reasons and so on. It was just too much. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, from 2013 until the pandemic, very active. And there were other people, Craig Considine, many other people also lecturing on the same topic. There was a lot of interest. Of course, all of this co coincides with the crisis in, in, in uh, you know, with ISIS. Um, and so, yeah, I spoke, uh, you know, to ambassadors and diplomats and world leaders about these documents. 
and how they could be used to counter uh, radical uh, uh, extremism. And they were integrated into many of those programs uh, in the United States, in the UK, and so on. And so there was interest there uh, on the part of some people for, you know, well, in a, a large part for political reasons and, 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 and considerations, there was interest. Um, yeah. Now, in, in terms of suppressing, see, the, the problem is when you're dealing with uh, nation states, well, um, how do I say it? Well, you know, they have agendas. You understand what I'm saying? They have agendas. Um, if it's in their interest to promote extremism, they will promote it. Uh, if it's in their interest to promote moderation and tolerance, well, they will promote it. So yeah, it places one in a very awkward situation. Um, yeah. Now, in terms of an agenda to suppress it, well, you can just go to to, to YouTube and check out what the, what uh, you know famous Islamophobes have to say about it. It really upsets them. Because actually, they share the same version and interpretation of Islam as uh, the radical Islamist, right? Uh, exactly, right? The Islamophobes and the Islamists, they see eye to eye. They interpret Islam the very same way. And so those Islamophobes were very upset when the covenants of the Prophet came to light because it, it undermines their misinterpretation of Islam. And uh, yeah. I mean, it, it it pours water on on their on the, the their fire of hatred, um, yeah. When they'd like to be throwing gasoline on it, so yes. Uh, so there are forces and 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 parties out there who support these documents. There are nation states that do Muslim and non-Muslim, absolutely. Um, there are those that oppose them. Um, you know, these Islamophobes oppose them. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyhow, I don't want to get too much into detail, uh, but yeah. Uh, well, well, thank thank you so much for addressing those questions and um, and just for for sharing a lot of your your background, your your own personal journey, and um, you know, just the the wealth of scholarly uh, expertise and knowledge you have on. On this subject, and I think a lot of the sources that you mentioned, a lot of you know the books that you cited and some of the authors you cited, are definitely things that you know, if anyone listening, like that they should. Like I, I, uh, I have a, a Craig uh, Craig's book um, that you mentioned, and I personally found it quite fascinating. Um, I mean, you know, reading a couple of the other bo other books and like how how the Christians saw the Muslims, you know, the various. Some of the dimensions and, and very Syriac chronicles and yes, uh, yes, just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, yeah. When Christians met Muslims, uh, a prophet has uh, arised or whatever. All of the many, many books. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. You know. Yeah. Yeah. When Muslims met, when Christians met Muslims or whatever. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I will. Um, I will definitely. Uh, like to put you know at the bottom when I upload this to YouTube uh, links to uh, your books. I especially I like the the one that that has the six covenants. Uh, that that the short one it was it was actually very handy to just kind of like you know there's a little image of you know of, of a text and then you know the 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 the, the, the treaty itself and I, I think it's a fascinating reference books to just kind of like look through and look at the similarities and and and, and text uh the similar formulas between um the different ones and, and the provenance you know how, where they where they were located and so on and so forth i think this is a, a incredibly rich vein of inquiry and, and it, it could just be mined quite a bit and i, and I think it's quite necessary especially given it's interesting to me what you say uh, it, the, the point that you make ironically of how much the um the uh, quote unquote islamists and the islamophobes actually see eye to eye and i personally believe that you know that 
a lot of the vision of Islam that yeah, you, you talk to ordinary Muslims who have grown up as Muslims their entire lives from some traditional country. Everyone has their biases. Everyone has, you know, you know the ways they will see foreigners, non-Muslims, people from outside their borders. But you know, just talking to people, just natural, organic conversations with people and their perception of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his mission, you know, his mercy and these things. It's completely different than what a lot of these doctrinaire, um, dogmatic, um, tech theory types bring to you know just just your normal like, you know, some farmer in, in the middle of America, you know, some guy with a donkey in America. You know, it's it's you know, wh whenever I travel, I try to talk to people, and just the organic understanding of Islam that people just naturally have that they grow up with in many parts of the Muslim world. It, it may not be the most erudite, but just they don't have this like dogma. Oh, there's things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was I was speaking about the benefits of education, but yeah, you know, we need to consider the dangers of miseducation. Uh, so sometimes, right? You know, I was asked once. You know, yeah, I was asked about that. Um, and, you know, what's the solution? I said education. And one sister from Morocco told me, but our parents weren't educated and they never had any of these extreme ideas. And it's that Islam that was tra that was transmitted traditionally from generation to generation, those values and principle. Our, our, our parents are illiterate. Our grandparents are illiterate, but never, never would they have held such beliefs or believed in such things. And, you know, if I ask my mother-in-law, who's like 90 years old and, and who's from Morocco, I mean, they just shudder at the thought of, uh, you know, ISIS and this and that. They don't understand. They don't recognize that religion. Um, so many, so many basic things. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes, uh, yeah, ignorance is better. <laughs> or, or maybe ignorance is better than this education yes 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 yeah but 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 you know i find that when she goes to the mosque she comes back with crazy ideas right and and, and she's getting radicalized um uh, and, you know, she's throwing away the perfume and stuff. And she says, perfume is haram. And she can't put perfume. And I said, la, la, Fatima, you're 90 years old. <laughs> okay. What are they teaching you in the masjid? They're just they're, don't listen to these khutbas. Just do your salat, pray at home, whatever. Don't let, and just like, like they're preaching like nonsense from the minbar. Uh, you know, it might as well be a mini bar. It's as if these people are, you know, drunk. Uh, there, there's the insanity. I don't. Anyhow, but again, it's uh, the, the, this. It's it, it's really a foreign religion to 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 these people. You know, mm. at least that version of it. They. Yeah, it's, I I suspect that if it wasn't for a lot of the petrol money coming out the Gulf, I, that it would really be a foreign religion to most Muslims even to this day I, I really believe yeah, especially talking to older people from, from different parts of the world like Moroccans, Algerians um, Tunisians were closed off in a secular like box for ages so you know right. but uh, you know, definitely talking to Moroccans and Tunisians talking to like Mauritanians people of a certain age like people like basically over age you know from 45 to like the 60s and 70s, you know, talking yes, to yes, yes, Syrians. Yeah, it's this like they remember, and some of them were like, Well, we had that was Jahiliya, we were Jahil then, but then this came. I'm like, But wait, you're doing this and this and this, and your parents did it, and your grandparents did it. It's like, Yes, but that was before we knew the Sunnah. But then other people are like, No, <laughs> we had the Sunnah. It's like, Of course, it's, it's of course, yeah, it's it was like, a living Sunnah, yeah, yeah, living Sunnah. Is it what terrible. My, it's terrible. One my uh, this Moroccan dear friend of mine calls uh, these people Talafis, not Salafis, and he says, and they basically said they're garage people. It's like, yeah, these guys, and then, yeah, I didn't understand what he said until I actually started traveling, saw this. Like, yeah, you have these old guys. They will only pray in their garage because 
They don't go to the masjid because those are the people who are shirk in the masjid. <laughs> they'll just sit there and they'll pray in the garage and, you know, it's, like, it's unhealthy. It's very psychologically unhealthy and it's it's, it's, it's sad. And I, I hope that uh, efforts like yours and many others can maybe help open minds, inshallah. Well, inshallah, yes. I mean, we're all about the Islam of love and justice. Um, yeah, an Islam of uh, ethical and moral principles. Um, so yeah. yeah, don't yeah yeah you're you're all welcome to join us. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah. if you could give parting advice to in, any listeners who who might you know have some sincere skepticism or you know are left a little confused and, and, and want to know more, what would be some parting advice that you would have? Well, parting advice. And... Ah, that's a good one. Other than read your books, which I think would be an excellent idea. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, just start with that little tiny booklet, that Six Covenants, and, you know, for, forget about uh, issues of authenticity, this or that. I mean, do you or do you not agree w with these principles? Do you believe that people have uh, the right to life? And there are people out there who don't. Uh, you know, do you believe in freedom of religion? Uh, are you against forced conversions? Um, you know, are you against oppression? I mean, if, if you approach these documents just from like a, a values point of view, um, yeah. And I mean, I have people who object to the covenants and everything, and they disagree with all of these principles. Uh, if they're not ISIS, at least they're ISIS light. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yes. I mean, you know, read the Quran. Um, yes. Again, again, but see, the, I caution people, you have to be very careful uh, the translation that you're reading because uh, it's not actually the Quran uh, in some cases. Uh, there are uh, additions and interpolations and so on. There are ideologically motivated translations. Uh, there are sentences and sentences and sentences that simply are not there in the original Arabic. I can point to the Hilali Khan translation, for example. I could give examples of this, of how this scripture has been uh, misrepresented and distorted and 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 perverted, uh, and that's the only and and it's meaning inverted by these these translations. I mean, it's one thing to like translate it like as literal as possible and then give a commentary, but when uh, it's all intermingled, your commentary is part of the actual translation. You are uh, misleading people. I mean, there are translations of the Quran out there, uh, according to which women must wear burqas, and uh, they must cover their faces except one eye, um, or that women should wear chadors, okay? Uh, with all due respect, there is no burqa or niqab or chador in the Quran, but in translations in, uh, in English, uh, in French, in Persian, in Turkish, and so on. That's what the Quran actually says. Um, yeah, very, very dangerous. It's insidious. It's dishonest. Um, yeah. So I have to caution people about reading the Quran. And, and maybe it's a question of reading many different... Now you can do this online, where you can have like, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 different Quran translations just in English. Then you can have others in Spanish and French and other languages. Sometimes, if you don't master Arabic, it's what you're going to have to do. Um, yeah, to, to get a better idea of what the text is actually saying, because these translators have agendas. Um, so yeah, anyhow, love. That's it, love. That's my message, love. I, I like that message. So thank you so much for your time. Jazakallah khair. Well, barakallahu fika. And in mubarak jamian to everyone. Yeah, and anta kadalik. And, and uh, inshallah, you know, well, I, I'll, um, you know, I, I think I'll, 
I'll cut the recording here and then um you know we'll, we'll edit it and upload it and, and I'll send you a, a copy and um you know just um well I'll, I'll send you the, the YouTube link I mean and I'll put the uh I'll put your Amazon profile website in the description but if there's if there's anything else that you would like me to um put in the textual description of, of, of the YouTube uh, video you know definitely feel free to send it to me I'll, I'll just like copy the your biography from like your Amazon profile and all right, right. sure that's fine well you know just just a for everything I appreciate it giving me a a voice and and, and a podium yeah definitely I, I think it's I, I think your voice is so important. I mean, I wouldn't have heard about you if it wasn't for Charles Upton. But uh, I mean, maybe I may have stumbled across you years later. But like, you know, I, I have a couple other friends who got on the Covenants Initiative mailing list, and they they're fascinated by it. And you know, just looking, talking to people, trying to raise consciousness, awareness of it. You know, I, I noticed that Hamza Yusuf didn't wasn't willing to sign on to it for a while and i suspect that there's some you know the, the yeah i've been bay uh eventually like they, they will discuss these things but i kind of suspect that there's a lot of fear of what other people you know, it's, it's like the muslim community in general has these ideological voices and i think it, it I, and i hope like in my youtube channel i'm trying to interview different interesting people authors and thinkers and i'm trying to branch it out but i'm really concerned about um gathering narratives and stories and accounts that broaden people's minds and, and open people's minds and i think with a lot of the radicalization of muslim youth um you know it's like the, the young radicals grow up to be old radicals and then they i don't even know if the term radical is it's, it's justifiable like yeah yeah because radical from radix going back to the root this isn't this isn't going to the root and like there's brothers i've encountered who were falling into some of these tech this tech fearism yes and i don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist but a lot of this stuff i'm convinced but from what i saw as a teenager floating around washington dc and you know and, and bouncing through different circles and like what I've encountered and talking to different knowledgeable people, brothers who were who were in that and then got out, and other brothers who are looking at it from outside. There's so much just nation state political maneuverings. I cannot believe that you know that that the ISIS, Daesh people in Iraq and Syria are the ones now going across West Africa, the ones in you know, the Taliban were bad enough in some level, but then now the Taliban themselves have been tech feared and you have these mysterious people blowing up masjids. It's there is that uh Kharijite tendency, you know, that, that does exist. And I believe it's true, it's true. And I've condemned the, the Khawarij a lot in the past as well, but I've very considered my assessment uh, uh, of them i mean they're again it, it's their enemies who wrote these narratives and demonized them uh, uh, there there are some good things uh about the ibadis that you know uh, I, I came to discover um and, and so yeah that's uh, a good point yeah now, now for example okay so again so the khawarij the khawarij mm -hmm. Okay, they're, they're they're demonized by the Sunnis and by the Shi'is, and of course, I did the same thing. I said, you know what? I'm going to study Ibadi literature. I'm going to co co connect with Ibadis and, and get to the bottom of this. Um, they're very moderate people, by and large. Uh, they're quite tolerant. Um, yeah, they're not very strict about hijab or things like that. Um, Anyhow, so. Uh, and they, they repudiate the, the extreme Khawarij of the past. But in any event, okay, so these people revolted. Nobody questions why they revolted. Okay, so, mm. okay, why did they revolt? All right, so you have Ali on one side, and mm -hmm. then you have uh, Muawiyah on the other side, and Aisha and all of these people. Okay, mm -hmm. so, 
On the side of Muawiyah, um, they believe that the caliphate belongs only to the tribe of Quraysh. This is like a, even in, in Sunni you know, doctrine and everything. It belongs to Quraysh. That's that. Okay, it's a type of dynasty. Right. Sorry, it's very racist too. It's supremacist. It's a type of dynasty and monarchy and so on. On the other side, you have Ali, and he says, uh-uh, my family, only my family. But the funny thing about the Shia, they can never agree as to who was part of this family or which member should be the successor. And each time an imam died, they would break up into even more factions, everyone fighting for this and that, even within the same mm. family. Okay, mm. they say, oh, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq was the successor. Well, his brother thought he was the successor too. And uh, mm. you, you had brothers fighting each other. It was just like any kingdom. They, they were fighting for power. So, okay. And what was the point of view of the Khawarij? Any just, knowledgeable Muslim can aspire to leadership. Hello, egalitarian. Hmm. Based on Shura, very democratic. It was not a, dy a, a dynasty. It wasn't a monarchy. So wait a second. Are these guys really? Uh, so, uh, so you know, I, I've compared ISIS to the Khawarij, That's but I was wrong. That's not what they were fighting for. You know the other thing that revolted them? The marriage of nine-year-old girls. They thought that was the sickest thing they had ever heard of. The Ibali? Huh? The, the, the Khawarij, the Ibadis. That, this is one of the reasons they revolted. They said, what the F? No way in hell. Now, wait a second. These are Tabi'een. Some of these people are Sahabas. They had a radically different understanding of the message of this religion and its practices. They didn't buy this child marriage thing. And they, don't, I don't either. I don't either. And, but and, I'm sorry, you cut you off. But it, <laughs> that's something that fascinates me because I like, I've been, yeah, I am convinced that the, yeah, maybe Aisha, the Allah on her, said that. Maybe, you know, to her, but like uh, just looking at the hadith, well, the, they're not really hadith, they're like, um, Akbar Athar because the Prophet, yeah, I'll never say how old he was. And I mean, if Aisha was the youngest, okay, fine, that's reasonable, but I am convinced that I am absolutely convinced that if she said the, the age nine, if she literally used that then she was probably just speaking euphemistically like I was really young because like she was a and like yeah like hardcore Sunnis would stone me to death for saying this but yeah, just looking at people's personality the humanness of it Aisha was uh, she was a very competitive woman she really was that comes out in the orthodox picture of her she was like I was the favorite I was the youngest I was the, and she appeared to be kind of bossy you know you know there's these hadiths in which she would boss around other like uh, other wives of the, of the, of the prophet yeah. and i could imagine her as a middle-aged or older woman you know it's like okay well you know this woman has this this woman has that you know it's like well me i was the youngest well how young how young were you i was nine i mean the arabs you know their maybe literacy was more widespread among them than it's accounted for but there are these Hadith to say, you know, that, that we, you know, we, you know, we Arabs are unlettered people and we we don't count, or we don't count our ages, and these these accounts. And there's this slippery, you know, you, you see, like, you know, as far as even the even the date the Prophet was born, there are multiple versions. Yeah, uh, as far as you know, the accepted day of his milad, of his molid, but then there are other ones. I honestly don't think that. At least in Croatia, in the Croatian Mecca, I don't think they really kept track of their age very much, and I just I don't buy it, you know. Especially since it's it's not it's not like there are many isnads for this report. It's just like Aisha supposedly told her nephew, who supposedly told a couple other people. Yes, she right. said she was age nine, and I didn't realize that was one of the bones of contention on the Khawarij. But you know, if they're 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 revolting, 
decades, you know, decades later, they tie me in. Maybe this was something that was like becoming a widespread narrative, but and I, here's another curious fact. When they took Kufa, they were led by a woman warrior who led all the men in prayers. Now, this is not Daesh. This is not ISIS. Okay, right. so these are people who also had women leaders and who believed in women-led prayers. They sound more like reformist or, or so on, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. they, they don't fit this <laughs> profile. That. Yeah. So... And by the way, Ibn Taymiyyah even believed that women could lead prayers. You won't find a Wahhabi telling you that. Didn't Ibn Hassan <laughs> as well? Didn't Ibn Hassan <laughs> as well? I, I seem to remember, because Ibn Hassan is supposed to be one of these very strict, like... Yeah, he's yes, you know, Ibn Hassan as well. Absolutely. <laughs> this is fact. It's, 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 but then again, it's, you know, we have a mostly unread tradition. There's, there's so much rich variance. Yeah. You know... Um. People don't embrace it, you know. You know, it's. But I didn't realize that that was one of the contentions of the Khawarij, um, or the Ibadi. Yes, they, they were very strict in their belief in egalitarianism. Yeah, and these these contemporary Islamist stuff. So I wonder if maybe the you know, suppose you know, there's there's prophecies, there's prophecies, hadiths about. Uh, people will go through the dean like an arrow. You know, they go through the target, and you know, you pull it out, and then you know, it comes out the other end, and you look at the arrow and you think, how could it have gone through it? Maybe that doesn't, you know, if it's authentic, if he actually said that, which is an if, maybe it's not referring to the, the historical Ibadis. Maybe it's referring to these people today, um, these extremists, and maybe there's. Uh, It's, it's, it's interesting to examine unexamined history, I guess, in unexamined oh, yes. history. Yes. Well, it is. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, thanks again. I'd love to talk some more, but I have my guests at home and I disappeared. <laughs> and, and, and I should, you know, it's just Eid, so I, uh, I need to check in with my wife too. But thank you so much for your time. And uh, when, when you, when I, when you're, whenever you're free, if you want to do something, more formal or something more informal or both i would i would be delighted because i, I think it's something more need more people need to hear and I, I think more voices out there just repeating a message of you know to think and re-examine you know our tradition and sources and think about it because i like what these people are blowing but that's not the islam i believe in that's not the islam you believe in and it 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 breaks my heart that there are people who believe both the people doing it and the people who are disgusted by it and say, I want nothing to do with it, that they believe that that is Islam. And it's it's not. So I'll let you go. Um, yes, and, and I hope.